set up on the wheel uh, for my dark brown clay. Uh, actually, it's the sand color clay. Um, and I'm going to make some little sheep uh, sauce jars, or I'd call them mint sauce jars or sugar jars, um, in the shape of a sheep. Um, I don't sell these very quickly. They're a specialty item, but it's nice to have them um, because it's kind of a conversation piece as well as just a utilitarian piece. Um, so I've got pieces of clay here. I just weighed them and they are between 350 and 440 grams. So 440 is just under a pound, 15.6 ounces. Uh, so the 350 is probably about 12 ounces. So, um, so they'll be small pieces. Power. This wheel is a uh, Brent CXC, which is very old, and it still is great wheel. If they ever come on the second-hand market, you should go for it. It's worth, especially with the price of wheels today, you should pay. I think it's probably worth five hundred dollars, even though it's like thirty-five years old. But anyway. Um, this one is the 440 grams. This is recycled pugged clay. Um, so I'm just gonna make small cylinders. So to start off, that's why I've got different uh, weights of clay, because I don't know, you know, when I'm making these, just how big the customer's gonna want it. So I make them different sizes. So this is the body of a sheep. <laughs> in a sort of general way. I make it not too thin at the bottom because it's got to stand on some legs. So I centered the clay and then I'm just pulling out. Run my finger back to the center. For beginners I'll do a, a little detailed one after this. For the advanced people you can skip over that if you want. <clears throat> but all I'm doing is making a small cylinder. Not too thin at the top, so I'm letting go now. If you leave it a little thick, it gives you the ability to do some fluting too. a little groove underneath. And then you can have it as a traditional cylinder. You can taper if you want to. I just like to have these as a little cylinder, basically. Make sure the wire can get under there. This was a big car washing sponge I found at the hardware store and it's been, I cut it into quarters. It's been, God, I did that years ago, so it's lasting a long time. The little round cellulose sponges are nice from the pottery places, but I got four out of one sponge here. And I think it was only like $2 or something, but anyway, that's a straight cylinder. It's got a fairly thick bottom to it, um, and uh, so I'm going to put little legs underneath this, and now I'm going to have to make a, a roof for it, or a top for it. So let's measure what we have here. And I'm going to push that in a bit so it's not quite as tight as the lid as I sometimes get. I'm, I'm noted for making my lids too tight, and then always have to trim a bit off, which is why it's no big deal. But anyway, let's get this, so just dribble some water around it. And while it's still rotating slowly, you just pull through and it will release and then comes to the edge and you quickly before it manages to re-stick, slide it onto your hand and then you've got a, a straight cylinder. All the ball of clay. 
if you're a beginner, you should have a round ball of clay to start with as well. It's easier to center it. Make sure it's sealed down tight. I don't take that clay off the wheel and I just get the water wiped off with a sponge and then you've got a sticky surface to put the new ball of clay on. So that's a good tip. And then to center, you wrap your body and your legs as close to the wheel as possible. Lift your left leg up a bit higher so you're not leaning on the edge of the splash pan. Um, you know, on your thigh basically and then this hand is going to be your anchor and this hand is going to do the centering so the left hand just stays where it is you try not to let it wobble and then the top hand comes down and you make a hockey puck and you let go slowly before it's centered because it's drying out left hand comes in without any pressure top hand comes on puts the pressure on then the left hand goes in and puts pressure on too and if you're lucky, it goes into center straight away. And that goes slowly. That's hard. It looks easy, but you just have to do it a hundred times. Um, everybody wants to make a pot straight away, but if you concentrate on the centering and you keep it centered, you know, everything else is easier. So, all right. If it's not on center, you've got to wobble to it. Just quickly cone it up. Both hands either side, just making it cone nice and deeper. And then center it the same as you did before. And if you're pushing it down, it sometimes is a little easier to go into center that way. And then let go slowly. But you should be able to do it without the cone. As long as your clay is good. This is recycled clay and I'm going to pat myself on the back because it feels good. Okay, so putting the hole in, I use finger and thumb on my left, on my right hand, anchored to my left hand. With this hand gliding right on the wheel, see how it cleans the wheel out? You've got dirt on your wheel. And then you put this hand down, it goes clean all of a sudden, so you know you've anchored this hand on the wheel. So it's important your wheel isn't bumping up and down, because then your hand would bump up and down. Um, so a nice pad underneath, you wet it, and then you put finger, finger, and thumb there, and you find the center. And then before you press all the way down, you feel for the center, then you put a little dimple in, and then you feel the point where it isn't wobbling, and that's where you'll push all the way down. And I use this little finger on that one to make, make a bit more strength. And then you push down, and you pull, without going too thick and thin, remember, you pull all the way to the outside before it dries out, because as soon as it dries, it starts to catch on the hand. And then here's what I always do to get rid of the S, S cracks potential is to put my finger from the outside wall all the way to the center again. I was told to do that and I don't have S crack problems so I always put it down to that but it's about compressing that center point making sure there's no kind of uh, what feels like an inconsistency in the, in the center there. So you're doing that until you feel like it's just all the same consistency all the way across and usually you can do it in one push there but, uh, you, you know just feel until like, you feel your the finger isn't kind of suddenly going in because that means it's very soft in the center so it's the water in the clay that makes it shrink more and that's where you get s cracks anyway these two fingers without anything on the inside you could just sort of compress them like that and make the thing get narrower but you want to pull a wall so you wet the whole thing put two fingers opposite two fingers and mine right arm is anchored on my right thigh now and then I do a pull with pressing with my fingers all the way to the top and my fingers are angled so that the clay flows over them to the top. See how this one is like 45 degrees and these two are 45 degrees as well and the clay just catches you into your finger and pushes all the way up over the top of your top finger and so it's pushing the clay constantly up. So two fingers on the outside, two fingers on the inside and you push together and the clay forms a bump above your fingers and that's what you're chasing to go up the wall and let go before you get to the top so you don't make it too thin. If you leave it slightly thick there, you can actually trim a little bit off if you want to make your lid fit a bit better. So you don't want to get rid of that potential by making it thin already. And then put a little gap in the underside. And then you basically use your metal rib. You can just use you can use the, the wood rib if you want, but just 
go all the way up the wall with the fingers on the inside and push against the metal rib and that makes it a rectangle. That's sorry, a cylinder. So you're just dragging the water off the outside basically. And that's it. Okay, what I do for the lids, I've got this is the way I did for the clay for the pot itself. Uh, I am just going to cut it down in half. And I make a good guess that that's enough to make a little lid. So, you know, it's a tiny piece, so I don't need to round it off. But if you're a beginner, you should bang that into a round ball. And then I've measured the hole with my calipers. So I'm just centering a little ball of clay. Sometimes the smaller balls of clay are harder to center than the big ones, but your hands have to tighten up so small. Anyway, center it up. This is a very simple style lid. Put your hole and just start pulling it out almost immediately. But you want to leave a little thickness if you're going to be doing some sculpture work on that area in the center or even on the outer edge. But, and I run my finger back just like I do with the big ones. And then I stick my finger underneath, middle finger, to give myself a lift, but not too far, because more need to collapse. And then I take my wooden rib, and you can do this two ways. I'll show you both ways. This way, I take the corner sharp it, and I simply put it in the middle of that lump there, and I press down towards the center of that lump, and it pushes basically a rib and a flange. So that's the easiest way to do it. And I just make sure it hasn't gone down too far, and I measure. It's a little bit too big, but by the time I just do this, it takes it in a little bit smaller. And then pull up again, make sure it hasn't collapsed a little bit. And then take your little sponge and wipe away any slurry of clay that may have formed there. I thought there was something skipping around on there. A piece of dry clay, I think. Oh no, it's a little piece of plastic. This is recycled clay. So I find all sorts in that. Just a little piece of plastic from something. Anyway, just do that, smooth it out, um, and measure it again. Perfect. Just maybe touch of trimming there, but. Uh, and then you can try putting water down. I always find it's hard to get the water to go underneath on these pieces, but when I take my wire, wet the wire a little bit, and pull it through slowly, and it usually releases anyway. There you go. And then push it onto your fingers, and there's your lid. You can see how far I pushed it out underneath there as well where you think that's going to need to be, and then you take your little pin and you go down a little bit, not too far, then take your pointy rib, so a little point on there, make sure it's wet, and then a little dribble water in there anyway, and you push that inside there, can you see that? It goes inside there, and there you've got your rim and your flange. Um, either way works, depends on what you feel like you like doing. And then we measure it. Oh well, that's perfect straight away. So after you've thrown a bunch, this is my 18th one. So uh, I managed to throw 18 of these jars so far, and I've got enough to make another one. No, another, yeah, another two jars, I guess I've got to make. Because I've got two lids I just threw for you, and I have to make some jaws to match. So once again, wet your rib of your wire, pull it in, go through, and see how easy it moves. If you just make that wheel turn a little bit. Onto your fingers, and then you've got the lid again. Okay, now I'm making the sheep's heads, um, and boy does this take a long time. Got to rethink the pricing structure of these, I think, because there's like 10 times more work in the head than there is in the jaw. But anyway, I've been working on these for hours, and I've got these ones done. Um, and as you can see, I'm learning as I go. 
I'm trying to get them to be a little less um, evil looking. <laughs> I, uh, they kind of, I mean, this one's got a bit of a smile on, but now he's looking like a gargoyle. Okay, the next thing to do here is trim the pieces a little bit so that the lid fits perfectly. And the way I do that is to actually place it on the wheel um, and then make either the opening a bit bigger or the lid a bit smaller. So, because um, it's generally always a, a tight fit because I throw trying to get a pretty tight fit. But this one, yep, needs a little trimming. So um, what I can do before it gets too dry, the lid is actually a bit softer than the pot actually, so it might fit anyway, but I just uh, open it up a little bit that way, which is not enough. Tighten a bit more. You can generally just push some pressure on the opening area. I'm just opening that a little bit. That's better. And then the next thing I do is you don't want to push the rim too far is if it's a little bit of a problem and it's still a little tight because remember you're gonna have a thickness of glaze um, and that makes it even tighter. I'll trim a little extra off. And that's why I was saying leave a rim a little thick so you can trim a little off the rim on the inside and on the actual lid. If I can hear something clicking, this is that recycled clay, my only clay. I'm turning orders down at the moment because I don't have clay to make them. Who would have thought that the most common material on the planet, hey? Actually, up uh, than water, I guess. I don't know. Maybe there's more clay than water, even. Okay, so that's that should fit perfectly now. That was taken quite a bit off. Oh, let's take a little bit off the. Uh, edge too, because that seems to be sticking out quite a long way. I always give myself too much rather than too little. And then you can basically compress it there. Put a little bit out there. There it goes in. Perfect. And then we've got to trim some off the actual, uh, let's get a nice trimming tool here. I can trim full speed, knowing that it's securely held on there with the get and grip bottom. And I was leaving a nice thick layer, so 
because I know I've got to stick that head on. Sometimes I'll stick the head on in the middle and other times, so I don't like to take too much off there. Because when I'm, when I'm putting it on, I kind of don't know what it's going to look like. And then for glaze, it's nice if you give yourself a couple of grooves or something with your trimming, because that way the glaze can actually build up and get a little thicker in places. Although these are going to be oatmeal glaze mostly. I've got several oatmeals. And this is a speckled clay, so it should give a nice quality to it. But I've still given myself a little groove in there so that the glaze will catch a bit. And um, I may even flute some of these. Let's get the lid out of there now. Be careful, because these are pretty soft still. And I can just sponge the bottom of these. If, in fact, I think if I will, yeah, I think I like to sponge because these are, I don't know, I can trim them, it doesn't matter. <laughs> if I push those into the bottom there, it would actually um, dent the, the rim, so I like prefer to when I'm trimming a piece that's still a little soft to use the actual pads that have arms. And they don't actually push on the rim, they just push in the middle part of the body. And that's that. But remember, I'm going to make little legs for these. So I just round it off a little bit. And then it's so soft, I'm just going to use my finger to do that. I don't even need to trim it, really. So that's it. But it's really soft still, so I kept handling it, but it would dent very easily. Okay, I have 18 heads and 18 jaws. And we really literally spent a day making these 18 heads just about. So, um, and it's a big investment in time. And I was a little concerned that the actual, these pieces, last time I made them, I don't think I made 18, and it took a few years to sell all the pieces. So this is an investment in, in the future, almost. And, and there is the idea that um, with sheep and goats, that there is a, an element of, you know, some people don't like goats, I guess. And, um, and I think that uh, the horns on a goat um, specifically might actually put people off because there are dark elements of course with goats um, so it's a it's a specialty item that I'm not sure everybody would like but uh, and all I'm doing is scoring and scratching to make this thing stick because these pieces are not soft clay like I normally do when I do my mugs with my handles um, these pieces are a little firmer so I'm just basically scoring and scratching until I've got a nice softness to it. And then I'm going to adhere this little piece, hi, <laughs> to the pot. And I've got the lid on the actual jar, so I didn't want to risk squashing it. It will come off um, because if you press down on the edge and this is sitting here, it might actually squash the rim. So be careful of that. And um, then you can smooth away any of that slip. Water makes clay shrink more. And so if you end up with clay that's really super wet in, in little crevices like this, um, it will get little cracks appearing as it dries. because of how sharp the actual little, um, you know, the change in form. And so over the years, I've noticed that if I, like in my handles, when I do my handles on my coffee mugs, I often put a little bit of clay um, in that bit where the bottom of the handle goes into the pot, because there's a, a, like a crevice there that uh, I've noticed little cracks can appear when you're actually working. So what I do is I roll this thin coil out, and it's a good idea just to give it a bit of a, a 
a kind of a, a V groove there and I just wet that lid big time so I've got this coil here it's brand new clay very soft and I simply press that See if I can get this into the picture here. So I'm pressing it into that join area. It's hard to do this when you've got your hand in the way a little bit. So that V-shaped groove is helping that to fill into that space without getting an air bubble because it fits, fits in there. And then using the end of my paintbrush, can you see this still? I'm just kind of backwards and forwards of blending that in. So it's, it's reducing the, the actual amount of crevice or groove there so that as the clay shrinks it won't actually move this a bit away there it won't actually a, a crack won't appear so water encourages cracks in clay because it makes the clay shrink more people canoeing right out of my studio here and then use the paint paintbrush just to finally blend that in a bit can you see it the back of the bra the back of the lid coming around high Bye. There you go. That's one. And then the next one, this one's a funny one. I'm going to stick this one on here because he's kind of humorous. Let's get you. So see again, same again.
Okay, next I gotta make the feet for these little guys. So I just roll a coil. I've got way too much here, but I've got, not, I've got 18 to make, so. But, um, there's lots of ways of rolling coils, and you can also extrude them. But there's no way I seem to be getting an oval this time, but, um, there's no way you have to do it, you can just do it any way you want. You can make little balls of clay too if you want to, it's just something that holds it up like four little legs. So, you know, I try to put pressure on forward and then pull back without pressure when I'm rolling a coil and that's how I keep it from going into that oval. So pressure forward and pull back without much pressure. There we go, so that should give me four nice little legs. And then there's my stick. So the way I cut these is I lay that down on a stick and then using this little cheese wire type thing, just cut the end off because there's always a hollow area in the end, so I don't use that bit. Add that to the next one. And then I make, uh, you can either cut one and cut it in uh, to four sections, so I'm going to do that. And then for evenness, I can just cut it. And this isn't crucial if it's not even yet because you can modify it later. But I make four little legs. Just by doing that. So we've got four of them. And then take the head of my sheep off. Turn this upside down. Pick you up a bit. And make four wet spots. The bottom of these is still pretty soft, remember, so I don't have to do any scoring and scratching. But if you're ever in doubt, it takes no time to just sort of scratch it up a little bit. And it's better to just be cautious and make sure that it's going to be stuck. But if your clay is really easy to smudge, as long as the pieces are a little bit damp, you should be fine. And then I take one, make sure it's not got a hollow area, and I stick it down, put four of them on. So I'm trying not to, I'm trying to make sure I don't get any. Now, if you want to put lots of time into this, you can make these into little feet, obviously. Put little toes in them, whatever you want to do. If you're making elephant jaws, you could put little elephant feet on them. And then I just, like we do with the handles, I move it around till it feels like it's stuck. And you can turn it around. If it's on a wheel, you can get a rotator, but my wheel is over here and it's got the other piece on there. And there's four little legs to make it stand up. Now, it's a good idea with a modeling tool or the paintbrush to just smooth those in. The finial of the, not the finial, the, uh, I've forgotten the um, ferrule of the brush it acts like a modeling tool with just a little bit of moisture on the actual bristle so it's easier to pull the clay down into the bottom. Last one. Like that. And then a 
another thing you can do, if you have one of these tools, um, it's nice. I, 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 I like the look of this, but if you get the, the parallel lines coming up, this is the bottom of the piece, remember, so most people won't even look here. But well, how nice if they see this and it had some extra special work done on the bottom where it wasn't necessary, but it's there anyway. And the glaze, of course, will make the lines even darker and lighter. And I'm very careful when I glaze these that I don't put very thick glaze on the bottom here. Um, I tend to rub it off a little bit because glazes run when you've got these parallel lines going vertically down. Glazes tend to pull into the shallow valleys and run a bit more. As you've seen with my fluting, that's how I get some of my best decorative looks. So that's the, and then obviously don't want it sharp. So you kind of try and soften the edge at the bottom. And then make sure you've got no unsightly bits. There will be glaze on this bottom area. And this is nice because you can you fire on those. And you've got a nice little foot for the, for the thing. And um, and then let's see if I can get a piece of paper here. And guess what? It's not finished even now. So what's the next step? Wait and see. Okay, the the next is I have to make a hole here, large enough to have a spoon that I'm going to make next, which will have the tail of the sheep as it comes over, um, but I need to cut a hole so that the spoon can come out of the jar, and there is a comment in here that I had a customer say, and I'm not sure if this is relevant or not, but she her question was if you have a jar and you put a hole in it then things can get into it um, like a fly um, a ant um, so there are considerations here as whether you should do this but the jar looks really good <laughs> function versus aesthetics um, but that's what I do is I use a quarter and I actually cut the little hole and then the last thing I'll do which you'll see next is I will throw a little bowl a tiny little bowl on the wheel for a spoon bowl and pull a handle to, and put it together to make the tail but this is basically what the jar looks like so you've got the little hole there where the spoon will come out of and next I'll show you the spoon. Now I'm going to roll some coils, just like I did earlier. For the feet. So push, pull, but no pressure on the pull. Push, pull, push, pull. And it should not get that oval thing going on, which I've always... I still get it occasionally, but... Um, if you push and then pull lightly, it doesn't seem to do that. And I think it's the signs of it's got a little bit over there, see? But um, generally it seems to do okay. And it's probably more likely you'll get a an ovaling folding like a flap almost. Uh, if you're doing a really big piece of clay so, of coils uh, that taper and I'm not sure what size yet so I just use my little thing and I'll experiment um,
Yeah, I guess that's about the right size. Now, on these pieces, I could have the spoon attached here, or I could attach it to the top part and then have the, the tapering bit as the actual handle. So I'm not sure which way around I should do that. Um, but um, I think that um, that may be a little thick for the, the actual spoon at this point anyway. So let's go a little bit more. Uh, this seems a little thick at the end down there. And this is gonna sit inside a jar and come out and it's like the tail of the, of the sheep or the goat, whichever it is, or the cow, as my wife said. <laughs> but, um, but it could be anything you want. Make a dragon head. I mean, it doesn't matter. Uh, a gargoyle. But anyway, uh, I have a stick. Where did I put my stick? Um, I don't know, this one will do. Um, and I, I like to give this a little interest. So I roll with a stick like this, because the glaze will catch into this now. And I've noticed that these, if I bend this, after I do this, it tends to crack where the creases are. Let me give you a close up of there. Let's put the light on here, probably you see a bit better. So you get that kind of effect there. Now there's nothing to stop you turning it over. And I did this over this way now. To cross hatch it a little bit. And then you get that effect, which I like as well. So I'm not sure which I like best, actually. You've got to keep these wet, moist. So keep a sponge with you, which is very damp, but not running water. And I, I lay the coils on there while I'm doing this, because I, I need 18 of these, remember? Okay, the next little thing I have to do is make a bunch of little tiny balls four spoons. And so I'm going to throw these off the hump because they're so tiny. It makes sense to center a tiny piece of clay. That's even harder than a big piece of clay sometimes. I mean, we're talking about something that only will be an inch, inch and a half across. About four centimeters maybe. So I just wedged this piece of clay. By the way, it's round, unusual for me. But, um, so I'm just centering it, same as before you wedge your foot underneath your elbow, so you're not leaning just on the splash pan. I usually have a brick underneath there, it's gone, I must have kicked it aside. And that helps to lift your knee a little bit higher if you put a brick underneath your foot. Anyway, so centering, make a little curve. Now there is a problem with throwing off the hump that you can get lack of compression in your little balls right in the center. So you've got to be a little careful with that. So all I'm doing is putting my finger in. It's practically enough already. And then almost would be good to have a couple of little sticks here, actually, just to throw with a stick. Make a ball. Can you see this? It's so tiny. And you know, just play. It's, uh, uh, you know, I'd like to think that this is the size that would hold a teaspoon of sugar at the end of it. So this is the, the experiment one, really, to get the sort of feel of how much I need to do. I don't do these except for maybe once every three or four years. I used to sell spoons with too much work. <laughs> so, they break too easy, that's the problem with spoons. Because people forget and they just go get the sugar, dip it in the coffee, stir it up, bang the spoon to shake the water off, break the spoon. So tell your customers it's it's a it's a really nice little extra, but they have to be a little careful with it. There you go. And I suppose you could cut it off with a pin. I was gonna just squeeze it off, but then it might topple sideways. So just, and the pin will hold it up actually. There you go, that's my little spoon. 
But I'm going to make this bowl really shallow and pinch it off. And we'll see what happens. And it doesn't matter if it's a bit deeper anyway. Yeah. So you've got to make sure your fingers are really wet. And then you simply put your finger in the middle and you keep pushing with your little finger till it releases. And you get where your finger is in the center, you get a slightly deeper hollow area. But anyway, that is 19 little balls. I've got one spare. Okay, now I've got everything kind of drying out nicely so I can handle these. Um, so I'm cutting off that little thick piece that actually enabled me to lift it off without denting the piece. And then I wet them. And score that a little bit. And there's several different ways you can attach these, so you can experiment yourself. But I like to attach it in a large area so that it doesn't break as easily. Remembering these spoons cannot be banged to shake the water off because they're clay, not metal. But people are in the habit of doing that, so I always tell people they should maybe, if they're going to have dinner, should maybe use a metal spoon with these. And this is just for those special occasions where you can warn people. But I score and scratch down the side like that. This one was done a couple of second minutes ago. And then so I've got, a, I'm doing a second bit now. Because these are firm, so they're not soft clay anymore. Just wet it so that that one's twice, that one's one. And then you can take your handles. I've got handles all piled up, drying out. And if you can see it over here, I've done several. And I'm going to do this one with the thin piece at the end again. But you can do these different ways, depending on if you feel like you want to be much more literal with the tail of an animal, which usually gets thinner as it gets longer. But I actually think it's nice if the handle is thicker as it comes out. But anyway, score and score. These are softer. So lay it down. Bend it over the spoon. And you can do this twice, two different ways. I'll show you both ways. Okay, so, and after you've laid that on there, without marking too much, so you don't damage the pattern you've done on here, just carefully brush that in a little bit. And then you turn it over. And if you want to have it bending level with that, you can do that, or you can have it sitting out a little bit. Okay, the uh, jars are pretty dry by now, so the last thing I have to do is make sure the spoon actually fits in here. Um, and I've noticed that um, the thin ones, when the fit's thin coming out, they're fine. But the thick ones, which are probably more functional, um, I have to cut a bit more of, of this hole to make it fit. There we go. And that should now mean the spoon will fit in there nicely. But like I said, functionally, a lot of people don't like a hole in their lid because it lets flies go in. Well, if you have flies in the house, then maybe you don't need one of these. But uh, if you've got a house like, um, with screens up and flies don't come in, you don't have to worry about it. But, um, but anyway, that goes on nicely. And then the spoons have been drying with a slight curve to them. I don't want it to be too curved, that's just hard to hold, but this will just be nice to come out here. So let's see if it works. So the spoon goes in. If I can stop it from without sugar in there or something, it topples, it rolls sideways. Um, anyway, look at that. Okay. So that one works fine. Here's one of the jars with the tail that tapers, um, and I kind of feel like that one, the hole is smaller where it comes out, uh, so that works better, I think. Um, it's, it's movable a little bit, so it's not too tight, um, but, um, but you could do it either way. Um, the actual spoon is pretty nice on the inside there. Like I said, they kind of look like pipes that you would smoke with.
but uh, just blow bubbles. Smoking's bad for you anyway. So, um, but um, and I was thinking about surfaces, and so I thought, well, I'll do a few things just to show some ideas of what we could do for surfaces. This is the potato peeler, um, which I use for my fluting, and it makes a, a really nice job of. glaze gathering in the channels. The clay should be perfectly leather hard to do this properly. Don't try it when the clay's soft. So that's one. Here we go. Fluting. This one I'm going to do the wiggle wire, which is this tool here, which I, I'm not sure who made this. Who made this one? Uh, dirty Girls Pottery Tools. Oh, I should do this first anyway. So what I do with the wiggle wire is, and this gets loose after time, so you always have to tighten it up a little bit, and, uh, I, and then the risk of breaking it, but um, actually I won't do it, but because uh, it still makes a mark. Nothing to do with a woolly sheep, of course, but just makes a nice texture. your little head back on. So you got a nice texture on that one as well. It'll pick the glaze up nicely. Don't do it when it's thoroughly dry here because you make a lot of bad dust. This is damp at the moment. So it's just, just about leather hard as you can see because it's falling off. So that's another one. This one I've got one of these serrated edge ribs here. So I'm going to try this. I don't know what it's going to do. Let's take this out just in case I catch it. So you can... Just do that. This would only look good if you were using a transparent glaze. Boom back. And that's another one. Another nice effect for these is the fluting plus fluting, I call it, where I actually flute, but I leave a little bit of a gap between the fluted groove. And then I take a trimming tool and I make another fluted line down the center. And I've done this on a teapot I showed in one of the videos that turned out really nice. So I like doing this now, especially on these sandy iron type clays. Well, this doesn't have much sand to it. It's quite a smooth clay, whatever it's iron. So we got fluting plus. I'm going to put the little spoon back. You've got to be careful with these so you don't snap off the bowl from the handle when they're at this stage. There we go. Bam. 
You can also flute at an angle. So you have to turn it as you're coming down, basically. I think the light is catching that nicely so you can see that one. That's a slightly different way of fluting so we'll see whether the glaze gathers in there and actually does a nice glazing job. And you could, of course you could take this tool now and just do the flight. Yeah, why don't we? In for a penny, in for a pound. There we go, so there's another one. Put the ball back in. And put the lid back on. That's another one, that's another ram. This sheep is saying, wee, I can fly. <laughs> I made his ears too big, he's more like a bat. <laughs> well, maybe not a bat even, but. They're funny. Oh, and the eyes, you can also make little grooves in the eyes if you want to get really literal about this. Well, there's no end to it anyway. So, um, take this little guy off. Um, so, I do this all the time in my uh, other pieces, so I thought I'd give this one a go too. So it's not, it's not actually so much fluting as just these kind of curved lines I put in the bottom of all my balls, actually. So you've got to be very careful not to go over the edge otherwise at the top because you can make it look like a chip out of the piece. I didn't find too much junk in this clay. This is the recycled clay. It's getting a bit, oh, having just said that, I felt something right there. But anyway, we'll see if we have a blowout. I'm still waiting for clay. There's the little side fluting, side carving. A very pleasant visit this afternoon from Deborah from Wisconsin. So hi Deborah, um, it was very nice to meet you um, and I hope the pieces arrive safely uh, and you had a really wonderful time in Newfoundland. I will post the videos of the finished pieces um, in a following video because I'm trying to post this for next weekend and they won't be fired by then, um, but um, I usually do post finished videos, but I'll take some pictures of them unglazed, you'll see what they look like. That's coming next. All right, take care, bye.